Okay, it seems like the inflow is slowing down a bit. Welcome. Thank you um, so much for joining us today. If you're tuning into this webinar, um, you might be wondering or trying to decide whether or not ESG investing is appropriate for you, or maybe you're just interested in learning more. Um, either way, thank you. We appreciate your time. Um, and today, we're going to be giving you a crash course on ESG investing, starting with the basics. What is ESG? Then we'll discuss SRI or sustainable and responsible investing approaches. And finally, we'll discuss the ESG portfolio that we've developed at the Center for Financial Planning. Um, but first things first, we want to introduce ourselves. My name is Callie Hassinger. I'm a certified financial planner and I've also recently attained the Chartered Sustainable and Responsible Investment Consultant designation. It's a mouthful, um, but this designation focused specifically on the history, the current environment, and the future of ESG investing. So clearly, this topic is really exciting to me. I'm very passionate about it, and I know that feeling is shared by my wonderful colleague and friend, Jacqueline Jackson, who is co-hosting with me today. Hi, everyone. I'm Jacqueline Jackson. I'm the Center's Portfolio Manager. I've been a member of our investment team for over a decade. And I've also been an advocate for social investing over the years. So I am really excited to share what we have prepared for you today. Um, to kick things off, Callie, I know you have a great graphic that demonstrates the growing popularity of sustainable investing. Um, would you mind sharing it with everyone? Yes, um, I love a chart. And this chart comes to us from US SIF, which is the Forum for Sustainable and Responsible Investments. And every two years, they publish extensive data on the numbers of institutional investors, money management firms, and investment products that are using sustainable investment strategies. The research dates back to 1995, so relatively new, but since they started tracking this information, um, sustainable strategies have increased 25 fold. And you can see, especially in 2012 and forward, it's exploded. So interest is there, media is there. Jackie and I do not believe that this is a trend that's going away. Absolutely. You know, Callie, in addition to what you mentioned, I do want to know, um, many people come to ESG for the E because they have climate change uh, top of mind. Um, but realistically, many funds are focusing on the social and governance pieces as well. So um, to hit the first part of our agenda, let's just go for you know the, the fundamentals. What is ESG investing? So you have these three categories, um, environmental, which involves climate change, resource depletion, waste and pollution, as well as deforesta deforestation issues. So your, the funds will address that. We have the social component of ESG, which are, which are working conditions, community development, health and safety, as well as human rights. And then you have the G component, which is governance. And that has to do with how a business is run, kind of the operations of the business. Um, so, you know, the issues addressed there would be executive pay, board diversity, um, avoiding, obviously, bribery and corruption, so, um, and also political lobbying. So, you know, as you can see, it's actually a, a pretty robust, um, you know, a pretty robust investment when we speak about ESG, and it's not just environmental. There are a lot of um, kind of holistic approaches to these types of funds. And this list, of course, is not extensive. Um, there are examples on each E, S, and G, but it's interesting, as Jackie mentioned, Many people come to ESG or SRI for that E, that environmental piece. And I believe it actually comes from the root of ESG investing, which started with SRI. And 
SRI has previously stood for socially responsible investing. It's evolved now, um, the SRI is viewed as standing for sustainable and responsible investing, giving her a broader meaning. But the term SRI has been used interchangeably with ESG. In reality, they aren't the same thing. So SRI strategies are used to manage risk while also generating social and environmental benefits. When developing an SRI portfolio, ESG analysis is what is used in virtually all SRI strategies. So if you think about it this way, SRI is actually the strategy and ESG provides the criteria or the standards necessary to screen the investments, create that portfolio. Um, with that said, however, the term ESG culturally is just, it's taken a hold. It's what people refer to in ESG portfolio. So we'll continue using that going forward um, and we will continue to use them interchangeably. But now you know the truth, they're not the same thing. Um, but why have we gotten away from using SRI? And it dates back to that socially responsible beginning. Historically, SRI investments have been associated and when it began, with one particular strategy, which was an exclusionary strategy, and it was often religiously motivated. Um, this purposefully excluded specific investments that were viewed as sinful or didn't follow a specific religious guideline. Um, however, this over time has been lost in favor because investors felt that this could result in missed returns, missing out on the upside because you're reducing your diversification. This myth um, haunted ESG for a while, and I would say less so now, because as we're going to discuss, there are several strategies that have evolved out of SRI and ESG. And actually um, that argument has been debunked um, by research throughout the years as well. Yeah, so you're raising a, a great point, Callie. And, you know, the reality is, is that ESG investing, it can be exclusionary, but in a completely different way from SRI, in a, in, in a more evolved way from SRI. So when I think about ESG investing, um, it doesn't revolve around religious beliefs. Um, ESG investors focus on sustainability. Um, and they do that by considering current cultural and world concerns. So in other words, ESG fund managers preference companies that won't be stopped by outdated production methods, limited resources, um, or non-operational business practices. For example, that may look like avoiding companies that are not developing fossil fuel production. It may also look like companies that still use animal testing or quality, so wanting to avoid um, those companies. Um, and so, as you can see, based on those examples, it's really evolved. Um, it's, it's more about sustainability. And of course, this um, is only showing a few examples. Uh, in theory, however, a portfolio could be constructed to exclude or avoid anything the investor wish wishes. So, really matching your values in your investments. Um, but as I said on the last slide, that myth of misperformance has been debunked. Why is it listed here as a possible downside, possible con to exclusionary investing? And it's because it actually can result in reduced diversification or unnecessary concentration um, in other investments. But we'll discuss some of the other ESG approaches that essentially take that missed performance issue off the table. Best in class, for example. Um, the best in class ESG analysis works to find the best investment relative to its peers. That means that no industry is excluded, um, rather, the investments chosen screen better than their competitors as it relates to ESG criteria. 
the hope with this approach is that you're essentially um, choosing really good companies. By default, you select companies that are run well, that will fare well during periods of unforeseen market changes. Uh, seems like common sense in some ways. You know, if a company cares about the environment, works to be sustainable, they may experience consumer loyalty or be less affected by resource limitations due to climate change. Um, if a company has good working conditions, that social piece, they will have fewer workplace injuries and have employee loyalty. You know, the governance piece, if, if the company's free from corruption, there won't be public scandals or regulatory charges. Um, again, seems like common sense and maybe a little bit idealistic, but we did see actually last spring um, during that extreme market correction, uh, the COVID correction in 2020, that a lot of the ESG funds outperformed the traditional funds, whether it's for these reasons or not, we don't know, but that is the argument and it seemed it did come into play last year. Um, the best in class approach is often most closely related or compared to passive investing. And that's because again, presumably you're choosing the best companies available. And with the best companies in each industry or asset class, you would hold those positions for a long term. Um, makes it one of the more popular ESG strategies. Passive investing, of course, is, you know, again, popular. It is trending. But um, a criticism of this approach is that your portfolio isn't necessarily ESG friendly as a whole. So a mining company, for example, um, could be included in a best in class portfolio. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're actively making um, strides to reduce carbon emissions. It just means that as compared to their competitors, their carbon emissions were lower. And some people don't believe that choosing the best company um, as it relates just to these ESG factors is enough due diligence or enough reason to hold a position for long-term. Yeah, and so, you know, what Kelly mentioned is very important um, because we always want to be transparent with potential um, ESG investors. So the ESG methodology does not completely eliminate certain industries. I mean, we'll talk more about the pros and cons of that, but um, it preferences for thinking companies in those spaces. So these products are ideal for investors looking for a more traditional financial analysis approach while using their investor dollars to encourage businesses to adapt more sustainable practices. So this is where ESG integration becomes appropriate. Um, and uh, we can discuss the ESG investment criteria in more detail. So essentially we're blending um, ESG factors with financial data. Um, so the, the traditional financial analysis approaches um, such, as a, such as valuation models um, and multiples or credit and cash flow assessments are completed. Um, but it's more of a blending of quantitative measures along with qualitative measures based on ESG factors. This approach can really complement or be added to any actively managed funds analysis process. If investments or companies appear to match each other from a financial opportunity standpoint, but qualitative ESG analysis, um, I'm sorry, I kind of said that in the wrong cadence, but if investment or companies appear to match each other from a financial opportunity standpoint, but qualitative ESG analysis can be used as the determining investment factor. Uh, the criticism of this approach, you know, this seems so far like the best blend, right? You're looking at the traditional financial analysis along with those ESG factors. But the criticism with this is that the analysis um, does not necessarily review companies from an E, S, and G standpoint. That's why we have that or black and bolded there. An investment can be chosen based on positive screening of only one of these elements. 
and that can be misleading for investors. Um, as we noted earlier, many investors come to ESG for the E. Um, they think it's green or environmentally conscious. That is not necessarily the case with ESG integration. An answer to this concern um, could be sustainability themed investing. And this approach is open to some interpretation based on the investor's needs or wants. But typically when we think about it, it's a top-down approach. So you look at a specific trend from a macro perspective. For example, um, animal cruelty or animal protections. It can be as general, it can be as general as environmental concerns and um, you know, focusing down from there, or it can be as specific, which is more often what I see from funds that are sustainability themed is more specific to environmental concerns surrounding water, for example, or deforestation. Um, and from there, you choose this trend and then choose companies and investments based on their individual strength and performance regarding that issue or that trend. This allows investors to really focus their money in investments that match their values. Again, you're coming to ESG, sustainably themed investing would really give you in theory that E exposure. Um, however, again, criticism, possible con, there's pros and cons to everything, is that these funds are very specific and they oftentimes don't provide diversification outside of that specific concern. I've actually gotten some questions from clients about funds like this. I think that they tend to be um, well advertised or really catch your eye. You know, if you see a fund that specifically mentions water, it's going to pique your interest a little bit more than fixed income fund. You know, you, you care about water, you use it every day. Um, so Jackie is going to talk to us a little bit about the center portfolio. And I'm curious if, you know, when we build a portfolio that tends to use a more traditional asset class, if any funds like this can fit into that, that portfolio or allocation. Absolutely. Um, so let's go back a little bit and talk to, you know, go more over, over the approaches that we discussed. So each approach we've discussed so far um, has both benefits and challenges. Um, so how do you choose which approach is best for you, right? If you signed up, you know, you were asking, should I invest in ESG? Um, how do you create a portfolio that incorporates your values while also maintaining your financial well-being? Because ultimately, I'm sure you want to retire um, and have resources for your retirement. Um, honestly, none of the ESG approaches we discussed are appropriate on their own right? But we found that blending these approaches alongside a disciplined investment philosophy is the best way to create a personalized and financially appropriate value-based investment strategy. So it's the blending that really can create some power for your investment strategy. So let's dig into the construction considerations of the center social strategy, which is our answer to investors looking to reach investment targets with values-based fidelity. Um, I'm going to talk a lot, so brace yourself, <laughs> um, but I wanna make sure you walk away um, from the call feeling like you have an understanding of our social strategy and our investment process. So um, you can kind of see and, and read along as, um, as I will discuss our investment process, although I'm not going to hit every point of this, but you can clearly see we have a very dedicated um, investment discipline. But here's the deal. When we talk about implementing ESG funds, we're talking about security selection. However, I want to take a few steps back and discuss construction fundamentals. They facilitate firm investment philosophies and are the backbone of every investment strategy at the center. So these, this is really a important, these are important components to, to our process. We don't want to forget about 
construction fundamentals because they significantly contribute to an investor's chances of reaching their financial goals. So take asset allocation, for example. Asset allocation is the stock to bond ratio suitable for one's investment goals. Conservative research attributes 40% of investment performance to asset allocation. That's conservative research. When we look at more liberal evaluations, it suggests that asset allocation accounts for as much as 90% of investment performance. So you can really see this is an important step that can't be overlooked when we talk about um, our investment process. Another construction fundamental I want to highlight is fee sensitivity. The, rea the reality is that investment costs add up and the compounding effect of those costs diminish returns. Therefore, considering the cost of funds is a vital part of developing investment strategies. And that, you know, the things I've explained, that's going to happen with our traditional portfolios our, or our traditional strategies. That's going to happen with our ESG strategies. Another construction fundamental, um, we're on there. Um, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, uh, diversification is another core investment philosophy of the center, um, and that largely influences our preference for ESG investments over the other value-based strategies that we've discussed. So I want to stress um, that factors outside of the security selection process play a prominent role in building a robust investment strategy. Keep in mind that values-based investing adds a layer to the construction process, but it doesn't change the foundational layers of that process, right? So, you know, a lot of times people can be fearful, you know, about transitioning their portfolio and because of, you know, maybe past research with SRI uh, investment styles, they may feel, you know, a, a little afraid to make that move. But, you know, again, I want to separate um, security selection from the entire investment process. There are a lot of pieces to the investment process um, that really support meeting your investment goals that are much, um, I would say, uh, they, they, they are more meaningful um, than the security selection process. So, you know, you, I, I want to, you know, help everyone rest assured that, um, you know, you can definitely do a process like this and uh, be successful with it. You don't have to feel like you are, you know, sacrificing to do something like this. Um, so now that I've addressed that point, <laughs> um, let's talk about security selection. Um, so our ESG portfolio goes through the same labor-intensive screenings and processes that we've always used, including both quantitative and qualitative screenings. So remember the graph at the beginning of the presentation? Um, clearly, ESG investing is getting really popular. Um, and as a result, we're seeing more and more ESG funds on the market. On one hand, it supports fund level diversification, which is a good thing. But on the other hand, it could set the stage for trendy and superficial products that don't really serve investors. So to combat this, we make an effort to work with companies that have a reputation for walking the walk. That's really important to us. So we look for companies that have demonstrated long-standing commitment to values-based investing through engagement with companies to improve their behaviors, or using or working with companies that uses its shareholder voting power to advocate for better company governance. Um, so it's really about walking the walk for us. We also like to see how funds perform over a full market cycle. So we largely eliminate, you know, the trendy funds that are, you know, popular now and coming into fashion now. We really want to work with funds that have um, time-proven strategies. They have to prove themselves. Um, and that's a major part of our security selection process. We meet with fund managers and company representatives before we add any funds to our portfolio. Um, and then thereafter, we continue to meet with them as a part of our due diligence process. So in other words, you know, just because you made the cut on the first round, it doesn't mean that, that we're going to stick 
uh, with the fund. We want to make sure that fund continues to do what we hired it to do. Um, and so, you know, having a very disciplined due diligence process is a big piece of that. We also run our funds through routine criteria checks to um, ensure fund continuity, right? Um, so we never want a strategy that, you know, we purchased it and it was supposed to, you know, support a particular aspect of diversification for you. And then, you know, over time it transitions to doing something else that it to do. So, um, you know, almost like cleaning your house where you say everything has a, a place and a space. <laughs> Same thing for your portfolio. Everything has a place and a space. Um, and so we're, we're really diligent about making sure that everything is serving the purpose that uh, we, we've uh, hired it to do. So I can go on and on about this because I love investments. Uh, and I'm really proud of the center's investment process. We put a lot of time and energy into it, and uh, we're we're just you know really excited to share it with clients and to work with people about it. So I know I'm going on and on, but I do want to leave you with one last uh, idea. Um, when we implement these types of strategies, I want you to be aware that we implement these strategies with your best interest in mind, right? Um, so that means, you know, if overhauling your current investment strategy um, is not a tax viable solution for you, that's not the direction that we would go, right? Um, we would think of a way that we can gradually transition your current portfolio um, to uh, to transition into these types of investments at a pace that makes sense for you. So again, I want people to, you know, rest assured that we're a financial planning firm. We're evaluating things, these things through several perspectives and making this type of transition, we would never do it in a way that hurts you or, you know, penalizes you. That is not our style. We are here to meet your needs and we want to do it in the way that uh, works best for you, and that also serves your value. So we will, you know, think of the best way to implement the strategy for you. So you don't have to worry about, oh, well, if I sign up for this, you know, are they just going to, like, completely gut my portfolio? Um, you know, every situation, you know, our, the investment team and your financial planner are working together um, to make sure we're doing the right thing for you. So want to make sure that that was said before we, we uh, move forward. And again, I know I went on and on, but thank you for holding space to hear about our investment process. Um, I'm happy to take questions. Callie is going to get to that uh, in a moment, but uh, I hope the information was helpful to you, and I'll turn it over to Callie to close us out. Thank you, Jackie. That was wonderful information. And um, just reiterating essentially what Jackie has said about taking care of our clients and having their best interests in mind. Um, we have one last point here. If you're a client joining us, you may be familiar with this slide um, because it's actually the same process we use for our traditional portfolio. And as Jackie just explained, whether clients are invested in the ESG allocation or traditional we're going through the same screening process, making sure that the allocation is just as tailored um, to client needs, uh, as tailored to their timeline, their risk tolerance, and of course their tax um, situation. So with clients, when we work with you, the first step is to develop this individualized financial plan. Um, we understand at that point how much risk your plan allows. How much risk does it require? And then we implement your investment portfolio. From that point forward, it's a matter of annually updating your plan and actively managing your investment allocation. So if you're interested in learning more about the center portfolio um, and you are a client, please don't hesitate to reach out to your planner. If you're interested in learning more about ESG in general, we have some great blogs on the website. Um, also, Jacqueline and I personally are always open and willing to share and answer questions. We both love this topic. We're passionate about it. We think it's the future of investing. So that brings us to the end of our ESG crash course. Um, 
I hope you've learned something and that you're just as excited about ESG as Jackie and I are. Thank you so much for your time and um, hope you have a great day. Take care. Thanks everyone. Bye. Thank you.